Thank you, Dominic. So hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for uh, tuning in. And uh, let me maybe start off by thanking my collaborators. Um, so Ryan Thorngren and Ashwin Vishwana. So yeah, it's, it was really a team effort and I learned a lot from both of them. So it was, it was a, lot of, a very fun project. And I'm very happy to talk about it now because it finally appeared last night uh, on the archive posting. So right, as the title says, I'll be talking about intrinsically gapless topological phases. So I should specify what do I mean by topological phases in this context. So today I will, I will be talking about a particular class of topological phases, namely symmetry protected topological or SPT phases. So by definition, what they are, are they're gapped phases of matter that have a particular symmetry, say symmetry group G. And as long as one protects or preserves that symmetry, the phase is non-trivial, meaning it's separated by a trivial phase uh, from the trivial phase by quantum phase transition. And secondly, that if one breaks down that symmetry explicitly, then one can connect it. So the last uh, clause is put in to exclude intrinsic topological order and these kind of things. So kind of concrete examples, you know, might have heard of topological insulators um, is a subclass of these SPT phases. Or a very famous example is the spin one Heisenberg chain, which realizes the Haldane SPT phase. And there's also higher dimensional interacting examples, for example, the bosonic uh, levin gu or CZX models, which realize the two plus one D SPT phase protected by bosonic Z2 symmetry. And there's plenty of other examples by now that I'm excluding from this list. All right, so I've given you the definition, but of course what makes them really interesting are their physical fingerprints. Um, in particular, it turns out that in the bulk, they're known to be characterized by quantized topological invariants. In, in particular, in one-dimensional systems, this is equivalent to having string order parameter for some non-trivial um, uh, string orders, as we'll see. And if one puts a system uh, on a manifold with a boundary, it turns out that they have interesting behavior at the edge of the system, where the symmetry turns out to act anomalously. And these kind of uh, phases of matter have been studied a lot over the past decade or so. I mean, now there's a well, uh, well-founded understanding of how to think about, about them in general and what classifies them. So in a lot of cases, you can classify them using something called group cohomology, but in full generality, you, you need to use cobordism, cobordism invariants to classify this phase of matter. And these kind of general concepts, when you, when you apply them to 1D, they reduce to essentially looking at different projective representations of your symmetry group. So for instance, you might know that Z2 cross Z2, right, has a, has a single non-trivial projective representation where the two elements anti-commute instead of commute. And indeed, there's one non-trivial SPT phase in 1D protected by Z2 cross Z2 symmetry. All right, so, so these, phase of, uh, these phase of matter are quite well understood by now. Um, but in the definition, you see the word gapped, right? And so in recent years, um, people have been starting to wonder, okay, what happens when you give up this condition? You know, what if you start to explore the interplay between topology and criticality? A first natural question you might ask, you know, are these topological phenomena of SPD phases, can they be stable when you close the gap, right? And surprisingly, the answer was found to be yes. And there's a whole series of works over the past decade um, that try to give concrete examples or explain why this happens. And I won't really talk about it in this talk. I will try to look, ask a different question, which is arguably even more ambitious, right? Which is saying, okay, um, if we don't just try to look at existing gap SPT phases and asking if they're stable to closing the gap, can we ask, are there SPT um, phase of matter that can only exist when the system is gapless. So, right, so instead, of, instead of considering gaplessness as your enemy, we, we start to ask, can it be our friend? And again, the answer turns out to be yes, which is, of course, the focus of this talk. And uh, the resulting phase of matter we call intrinsically gapless uh, topological phase of matter because our topology um, is only well defined as long as the system is indeed gapless. Now, what are some physical fingerprints of these phases of matter? Well, on the one hand, for example, if we focus on 1D for now, so in the beginning of the talk, I will focus on 1D because it's easiest to work, work out concrete examples. Then in 1D, we'll find that it has so-called impossible string order parameters. So I already mentioned that gapped SPT phases can often be characterized by string order parameters, but certain string order parameters are not allowed for gapped phase of matter. We call them impossible. But it turns out you can realize them when the system is gapless. And a second uh, property of these intrinsically gapless phases of matter is that they host emergent anomalies. 
at, in the low energy theory. And moreover, we'll see that these two properties are actually very closely linked. But before I discuss in more detail, I just want to give a general recap of these two concepts that I just mentioned. And it's a string order on the one hand, and anomalies on the other hand, to make sure we're on the same footing. Good. So SPTs in string order. And instead of uh, talking in full generality, I just want to illustrate it with a concrete example to give a sense of what I'm talking about. So I, I already mentioned, right, that Z2 equals Z2 protects um, a non-trivial SPT phase in 1D. And so a concrete physical uh, Hamiltonian that realizes this is a spin a half chain. So X, Y, and Z, they're denoting my poly matrices. So we have this one dimensional spin chain here with some uh, bulk Hamiltonian where the terms are uh, three set spin interactions. And it was discovered in 2011 that this Hamiltonian called the cluster model is a non-trivial SPT protected by these two Z2 cor Z2 symmetries, P1 and P2. So you see that these images are just doing uh, spin flip symmetry either on odd sides or on even sides and you can by just staring at it see that this indeed commutes with the Hamiltonian. All right so how, how does one characterize these kind of SPT phases? Well as I already mentioned string order is one way to go. So what is the string order in this model? Well I claim that this, this the expression shown here uh, has a long range order. So what, what are we looking at? So first of all we see that this here is a string of one symmetry. This is the string of P2, right? We only include um, poly Z on even sides. And the claim is that this string has long range order. Uh, are you saying, are you saying, you're muted in case you're, I see you're saying something. Or, oh, okay, maybe it was not to me. <laughs> um, so we see that we have the string of P2, which is, act, is acting with poly Z on even sides. And the claim is that this has long range order if and only if we put some endpoint operator here, which is odd under P1. Right. We, see in, we see that X on uh, odd sides indeed anti commutes with P1. And so there is this um, discrete invariant there, right? So even if, if this endpoint operator was even, we would get a trivial phase of matter. But if the endpoint operator is odd, you can argue it's the unique non trivial SPT phase by Z2 cos Z2 in 1D. Okay. So I already mentioned that these SPT phases in 1D have to do with projective representations. This minus sign, you know, this odd charge, is exactly the same minus sign I was talking about the two elements anti-commuting in, in a projective representation. All right, and so to actually derive the string order, maybe just want to show how, how simple it is. Well, first observe that the Hamiltonian is a stabilizer code. All terms commute with one another, right? So in the ground state, we see that x e x equals plus one for every term in the Hamiltonian. So we can now use this to multiply a whole bunch of them, right? x e x. So this one equals one. But of course, if I multiply it with x e x, so I'm, I'm not writing indices. The indices are implicit on where I'm drawing them spatially. And if we just keep going, right? What, what I've ended up constructing is x and then z on even sides but we have this X endpoint operators, which is exactly the same object I've written here uh, uh, below. And you know, since it's just a product of things that are equal one, this thing actually uh, goes to a finite value. Good. And so why are string orders interesting? Well, I already mentioned one reason, is that by studying the charge of the endpoint operator, you can actually diagnose what SPT phase you're in. But there's a second reason. You can directly derive from them the fact that you have protected edge modes, all right? So let me basically illustrate how string orders imply edge modes. So suppose I have my system here from side one to side n, right? And string order tells us that if I have, say, a string of P2 with some, of course, endpoint operators, a suitable choice of endpoint operators, that this has long range order, no matter how long this thing is. So this intuitively even applies if you start approaching the boundary. It doesn't suddenly become zero. So now imagine having the string or parameter that are basically touching the boundaries or very close to the boundaries. It's not that essential, right? So, so what do we have? Well, let me write it here. So we have some order one number, which is the string order parameter value. And then we say we have x1, z2, z4, dot, 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 zn minus two, presuming n is even, and then x 
10 minus 1. So this is, the point being, this is non-zero. Okay, that's just a string order for a finite system. But the key point now is let us act with P2 on the whole system. After all, it's a symmetry. So we can just, we should be able to put it in the expectation value. You know, it might change the sign of expectation value. We don't care about signs. We just care whether something is zero or non-zero. But of course, that means that the string in the bulk um, annihilates, right? Because it's a Z2 symmetry. So what we get is X1, and there's nothing. And then there's Xn minus one times Zn. Right, so we just use a symmetry. Maybe there's a sign, doesn't matter. And then finally, we want to use the fact that if we're in a physical ground state, so there's no cat state entanglement, then these, for, for long enough systems, this correlation function factorizes, at least the leading order. So we get x1 times the other guy. But now the key thing, of course, is that if this was non-zero, then this is non-zero, which means that we've derived with open boundaries, x1 is non-zero. But x1 is a charged operator, which is basically telling us we have some kind of Ising order parameter, but it's only non-zero near the edge. So we have our edge degeneracy. So this illustrates that string orders can be very useful because they directly allow you to derive um, the presence of edge modes. And of course, I, I could discuss a particular example, but this is very general. So as long as you have any 1D system with an unbroken on-site symmetry, as shown here, U, the product of UN, you can show that for some suitable choice of endpoint operator, this has a long-range order. And particularly if the endpoint operator is non-trivially charged, then you can show that you have a non-trivial SPT phase, you have edge modes, and these kind of things. But even though string orders are very general, they're very constrained. You can't just try to make any SPT phase with any endpoint operator. In particular, if you consider, if our symmetry is just Zn, Z subgroup n, cyclic group, then you can show that any string order has to have a trivial string order parameter. I, I don't include the proof here, but one could do a very elementary proof without anything fancy and just show that it would be inconsistent for the endpoint to be charged. And this is a, a different you know, equivalent statement to the fact that there are you know, no, no non-trivial projective representations of Zn, which, it, which in turn is equivalent so it's from a true cohomology, right? It's which is this classification object of you. All right. So that's a, meant as a short recap of string order parameters and their value. Now I mentioned, and this will become important when I dis discuss our intrinsically gapless SPT phases. The second concept that I mentioned, which is anomalies. But before I go to recapping anomalies, let me maybe pause here and ask. Are there any questions at this point about what I've said? Uh, sorry, just a very simple question. Yeah. How does a non-zero value of x1 imply the edge degeneracy? Oh, okay. So you're asking uh, this, okay, why is this implying an edge degeneracy, right? Well, that's a question, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, right, so the point is that suppo um, suppose the P, um, let me choose, Suppose P1 is unbroken, spontaneously unbroken, right? If it was spontaneously broken, we would be done because then we have a degeneracy. If it's unbroken, right? Yeah, so um, yes. Now we are talking about the edge. It may be unbroken in the bulk, but... Yeah, exactly, exactly. No, that's good, right? So indeed, the edge might break it. If it breaks, then we have degeneracy because a broken symmetry always comes with degeneracy. Like the Hamiltonian preserves it, right? So if your ground state is not symmetric, then by acting with it, you get a state with the same energy and hence a degeneracy. I'm sorry, <clears throat> the, the, should we think of it as the symmetry being broken or not in this case, when it's only at the edge? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, you might say that a particular configuration breaks it. Um, the only configurations that don't break it would form bell, bell pairs across the system. And you know, suppose we exclude those, then a particular configuration breaks the symmetry. But you might not want to call it symmetry breaking because the configuration is not stable. But usually symmetry breaking, you can just, with an infinitesimal field, change the order. And so here, kind of the symmetry breaking can be easily changed by any infinitesimal perturbation. So it's a bit of a matter of, do you want to include kind of a robustness of symmetry breaking in your definition? 
No, but the question is whether there is a local operator that changes the expectation value oh. of x one at the end, and oh, I think yeah, there yeah, is. Yeah. Oh, indeed. Well, so um, if indeed that's the case, then with no definition, is it spontaneous symmetry breaking? Another way of saying it, the theory of, at the boundary is just a quantum mechanical system. Mm -hmm. Yes. So all I, all I mean by symmetry breaking is just that the ground state is not invariant under symmetry, right? That's, that's my definition, this, this slide. Maybe to answer your, the other question of, is there an operator that toggles the value of x1? Yeah. Well, either you can use the global p1, but there's also a, there's also a local uh, operator. You can, by studying the other string order, um, you would derive that I think it's z1 x2 is the other thing at the edge. So either, well, they, um, either one of them is non -zero. Like you can basically see that the edge, um, how to say, that x1 and z1 x2 are essentially how the symmetry x at the edge. And so they and, and to commute with each other. So if you're in a ground state where one is an expectation value, then by using the other one, you can toggle that. Um, well, but that doesn't look like symmetry breaking then. Because there's a local operator that takes you from one state to the other. Yeah, no, okay, right. That's what I was trying to say about it. it's not stable. As in, you can choose, you can choose what that, the symmetry breaking pattern is by the local operator. But the point is, whatever state you have, it's not symmetric. That's, uh, if you just take that as a definition, right? Like if, if there's no uh, non cat state like state that's symmetric, then I call it symmetry breaking. But we might not call, I don't care about the word symmetry breaking per se. It's just there's a non. No, the ground state is not symmetric. Is that maybe better? There's, there's no spontaneous symmetry breaking in the bulk, right? It's, it's purely oh, an sure. edge effect. No, Those are not on the boundary. If you have just a two level system with a Z2 that exchanges them, you don't call it symmetry breaking. Okay, I'm happy not calling it symmetry breaking. It's just the ground states are not symmetric. Are we happy with that? Or you could say that there's a linear combination, the even and odd ones. No, the linear, um, you can't, it's like a qubit with a, the only symmetric states would have to form bell pairs across the system. Okay, thank you. No, thank you for the question. So is it possible to add a perturbation localized at the edge such that after perturbing the ground state becomes non-degenerate and invariant? Yes, that's possible. Oh, invariant? So no, so you can make it unique, but you have to, at the cost of breaking the symmetry. You can show that as long as you preserve P1 and P2, there's no local edge operator that um, gives you a unique ground state. Okay. Good. All right, so there's no further questions about this. Let me go Let to- me, oh. Excuse me. Sure, yes. Oh, that analysis workflow like Ramionic uh, Parity symmetry, for example, maybe not a good example, but uh, that could also be. So, at the beginning of your sentence, it just glitched out for me. So, what are you asking about fermionic parity? I, I wonder whether this type of analysis also works yeah. for like fermion parity symmetry. Yeah, yeah, it does. For key type chain, you can be prohibited by just fermion parity. And exactly, exactly. Yeah, just maybe to very quickly mention. So but by the uh, the two side of H, the zero modes somehow are. Kind of uh, relate in some right. Trip. Yeah, so exactly. Right. So the distance analysis will show something like on um, left end age and right end right end right right hand side of age that could still be not uh, factor by two 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 separate expectation value like what the one you just showed us. Exactly. So indeed, if, I mean, if we take oh. so if you if you take fermion parity. For the Kitaev chain, you will find that the string order, basically it looks for, so let P denote my fermion parity on a given site. So schematically some string of fermion parity, but then you have some Majorana operators and it has long range order only with these endpoint operators. And now you see the endpoint operators are odd under fermion parity. So there's our Z2 invariant. So this is the case for Kitaev chain. And then using the same argument as before, you, you, you use it over the whole symmetry, sorry, over the whole system, you apply from and parity, and now you get that gamma one times gamma tilde n uh, has a non-local, has a non-zero expe expectation value, which is kind of the non-local fermionic mode that you can fill uh, or, or leave empty. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's turn to anomalies. The second ingredient or characteristic we'll be talking about in this talk. So what is an anomaly? Well, I'll, in this talk, I'll be talking about a particular class of anomalies, basically Toft anomalies. Um, but let me drop that adjective because all the anomalies are of this type. So we say that a symmetry is anomalous in a quantum theory if it cannot be gauged or if you cannot consistently couple it to a gauge field. Okay, that's a bit of a general definition. Why is that interesting, you might ask her? Well, it's some interesting physical characteristic. So first of all, you can argue that from this definition, it, it follows that the, the, this trivial, uh, sorry, the system cannot pose a trivial ground state. So that would be some incom somehow incompatible with this defining property. And secondly, that effectively, the symmetry cannot really act in an on-site way. Okay, so what do I mean by this? And what do I mean by anomaly? So I think it's instructive to maybe quickly discuss a concrete example. But again, one of these uh, spin chain that doesn't realize an SPT, but realizes an, an anomaly, right? So it looks similar to the previous Hamiltonian, right? So we again have our cluster term, but now we also added the paramagnetic term. And one can check that this system has an unusual Z2 symmetry, which is denoted by U. And I've written U as a product, basically, of two symmetries. And the main point to, to see is that U is not really written as an on-site symmetry. And indeed, the claim will be that it's impossible to write it this way. There's some, some kind of obstruction to making it on-site. Now, how, what, does one, what does it mean to say that U is some sense anomalous? And how does one diagnose this on the lattice? Well, basically, so one thing I should note is that this U squared essentially is one. So it's a C2 symmetry. There's a caveat there. I'll, we'll show that actually it's, it's u squared equals one only for local operators, meaning all local operators, they, 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 don't, they don't see u squared as doing anything. It's a trivial operator. But things get more subtle when you start asking about what are the charges of string, string, um, uh, string operators. So let, let us choose a particular string operator, which is basically made of the symmetry itself, because what else do we have, right? So when I say as n is the half of a string, let me actually just give a concrete formula. There's no confusion. So we just take the above definition, but I only take, say, take, take it on a half infinite region. It can of course be finite at large, but it's conceptually simple to think about half infinite. Right. So let that be my semi-infinite string operator. Now you can ask, what is the charge of this operator under u squared? Naively, you might think, well, it has to be one, right? It has to be charges because u squared is one. But it turns out if you actually do the computation, I won't do it for time reasons. If you just sit down and do the computation, you will actually see that, no, it picks up a sign. Okay, so this string operator is charged on the u squared. Which is, of course, very funny, right? Because we have a z2 symmetry. And that's actually the point of an anomaly, right? That even though it looks like we have a z2 symmetry, and that's true for all local operators, in some sense, it looks like a z4 symmetry when you look at certain um, string operators. Question? Yeah? Are you also truncating u in some way here? Truncating? Uh, no. Because I thought at least there are ways of defining u so that u squares to 1 on a closed system. Mm. Yes, on a closed system that's true. But that's, that's kind of the, the trick of the half of a string operator. That, you know, like it's... You can't really imagine it being a large but closed system because the string would have another endpoint and then minus one times minus one is one. So you kind of have to do this computation, imagining a half, like a, imagining an infinite system and you just have this string operator sticking out. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's a bit similar to actually the previous slide with like string orders for SPTs, right? If you just look at the string operator as a whole, it's, it's always chargeless. That's why SPTs don't have symmetry breaking. But in some sense, it makes sense to ask about the charge of a single endpoint. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, but it's subtle. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, right, and, and so maybe to make a connection with the definition here, you know, the fact that this U is funny, right, that it acts like a Z4 for non-local objects, that's very much related to not being able to gauge the symmetry. Because if you gauge the symmetry, well, what does it do? It, may, it basically makes these kind of string operators local objects, right? Because if you have this semi-infinite string sticking out, but the string is just a gauge symmetry, so only the endpoint is physical, but now you end up with physical operators that would actually have a, uh, you know, for which the gauge symmetry should be Z4 in a way, but it's Z2 and you get some kind of inconsistency there. At least that's an intuitive way. You know, that's not a very rigorous statement, but that's an intuitive way of seeing why there's some issue with gauging this symmetry. Mm 
Okay. So um, good. And so that's anomalies. Um, so, I've, so far, I've discussed SPTs and anomalies. Now, as many of you know, there's actually a, a deep and general connection between the two, which is that if you have a d-dimensional system and you have some anomaly, just like the type we just discussed, right? We just discussed the Z2 anomaly in 1D. Basically, you can always, almost always, um, think of it as living on the edge of a higher dimensional SPT phase protected by the same symmetry. Okay, so there's been a lot of work and a lot of insights in this. So there's probably a whole whole list of references I should put here. I just put the first few references where, and the first few references where historically I could see literally talking about the connection between anomalies and SPTs, but it was already implicit, of course, in earlier works and, uh, and a lot of important later works as well. Now, as a concrete example, right, so yeah, I just copy pasted the model I just discussed, which had this anomalous Z2 symmetry. Now, indeed, as, an, as a concrete example, um, you can think of a 2 plus 1D SPT, so either 11 GU model or the CZX model, so there's some two-dimensional system here. And as, as a two-dimensional, two plus one-dimensional system, the symmetry is on site. So it has some Z2 symmetry, say given by something like this. So what turns out is if you actually, in, in some sense, integrate out the bulk degrees of freedom, or you drive some kind of fixed point limit, then you get an effective boundary action, U, where, you can and then use written as some kind of quantum circuit, which cannot be written in some on-site way. So it's non-on-site symmetry at the edge. Or you can say it's anomalous. Okay, and so there's a very general connection um, between SPTs and anomalies. Good. Now, in this talk, I will try to talk about a different connection we can make between anomalies on the one hand and SPTs on the other hand. Catch being that it'll be gapless SPTs instead of gap SPTs. But importantly, the connection we were talking about is always in the same space time dimension. We'll be relating anomalies in D dimensions to gapless SPTs in D dimensions. All right, so that brings me to the main message or main messages of this talk, right? To kind of give a sense of where are we going. So um, I'll be trying to point out that if you're, if, suppose you have some gapless system. Suppose you have symmetries on site, so no funny business, no anomalies. We have some UV lattice model with no anomalies, honest to God system. We will show that two things are possible. Well, first of all, it's possible to have long range order in string order parameters, which are impossible from the conventional point. You can edge modes which are impossible. Um, by impossible, I mean that you can show that any gap space can never host such string order parameters. As a concrete example, We'll be discussing an SPT phase protected by Z4 symmetry, whereas we already mentioned that cyclic groups cannot protect SPTs in one space dimension. And secondly, I'll try to, to show that the systems with low energies host emergent anomalies. Okay, so what I mean by that by emergent will become more concrete, but the point is somehow that even though the total system is not anomalous, if you just look at the low energy degrees of freedom, it looks like you have an anomaly. And then finally, the important point is actually these two are equivalent characteristics. And they define what we mean by an intrinsically gapless SPT phase. And maybe here an important or useful comment to make is that when people have studied anomalies a lot already, so you might ask, why has this particular thing not been studied before? Well, there's a good reason. Is because usually the way anomalies are studied is either is living at the edge of an SPT, right? And then say studying the edge of the edge is not a natural thing to do, right? So you wouldn't um, talk about the edge modes of the edge of the edge. Or secondly, the anomalies have been studied in, in their own space and dimension, like the previous example of Z minus XZX, but then at the cost of having a non-on-site symmetry. And again, then it's not natural to cut off your system because how it's not, there's no canonical choice of saying, oh, this is how my symmetry acts at the edge. Okay. So the main point is that that's why it's important that we act work with on-site symmetries. And it's only that the anomaly is emergent. But, it's, but the fact we have on-site symmetries means it's always well-defined to have a boundary. And then it turns out that the boundary has edge modes. Good. So maybe it's a good time to pause and, and check if there are any questions at this point. Okay. So that brings me to the outline for the rest of the talk. So I'll be going from the very concrete to the quite more general and perhaps a bit more abstract. So 
I'll start with a concrete lattice model, starting in 1D, where it realizes one of these impossible string or parameters that I mentioned. So-called Eisenhower chain will do that for us. And this will already give also some insight into why we have an immersion anomaly. But to really get a good grasp on what is this immersion anomaly and why is it happening, it'll be useful to also look at the field theory description of the same model. And then finally, the most general point of view, which applies to general symmetries and general dimension, will require us to look at partition functions. Okay, but let's start on the lattice. Good. So um, what, what is our system? We're imagining a one-dimensional system of fermions. And so on the one hand, we have the Hubbard Hamiltonian acting on these, so it means that the fermions are hopping, and there's some Hubbard interaction, some repulsive onset interaction. And we add to the usual Hubbard chain some Ising anisotropy that's shown here, right? And when I, say, when I write down SE, what do I mean? Well, of course, a single spin operator is a fermionic bilinear as shown here. Right. And uh, given that we have some Ising perturbation, it's natural to ask, what is the Ising symmetry in our system? Of course, it's just a pi rotation on the x-axis, right? Rx, as shown here. There's nothing special there. But the thing to worth pointing out is that if you square Rx, now you can check that you actually get fermion parity, right? So in other words, Rx is a C4 symmetry. Okay, so now what's interesting about this model? So before going in details, I just want to give a general flavor of what's going on. And we can we can almost guess what's going to happen. Okay, so that's why I highlight the, highlighted the two red terms in Hamiltonian. These are the two important parts to uh, look at to figure out what's going to happen. So let's take u large for a moment and half the length. So we have one fermion per site. Then we expect to be in a mod limit, right? Where every site has one fermion. Uh, well, it's stronger than expectation value using the mod limit and equals one on every site. And of course, if that's the case, we effectively get a spin chain, right? The only remaining degrees of freedom are spin a halves. And then if, uh, let's presume that JZ is large, right? And effectively, we can think of our ground state as some icing anti magnet, schematically shown as this. And this has symmetry breaking. Right? You see that SE has a order parameter, and it's non-zero, right? Which, of course, anti-commutes with Rx. So we have symmetry breaking. Or one can, of course, similarly write that the limit SE Uh, there's a long range order in this correlation function. This goes to finite value. Nothing, nothing new under the sun there. Now, what, is, what, can, what interesting thing can happen? Well, let's now start using this chemical potential. And let's imagine we tune away from half filling, so we dope our system, right? So now, if we dope our system, well, you know, we might still have antiphonic order locally, but then we have some holes now and then, right? So finite density of holes. Now, what does this mean? It means that if you say at a fixed site and you ask what the expectation value of spin, it's equally likely to have a spin that points up or spin that points down because the holes can fluctuate and move the spins around, right? So we lose long range order. So what are the two consequences? We lose symmetry breaking. Symmetry is restored, essentially, as a claim. And secondly, there is still some hidden order right is the fact that even though the spins their position can fluctuate if you would imagine removing all the holes which is called squeezed space we see that we have anti fermionic order in that space so to, to pick this up in the original system we can look at a string order parameter so in other words sz and sperm and parity will still have a non-zero long long, um, long range limit Right, so it's because for every hole you pick up the sign of the parity, which offsets the fact that you, you don't have a spin there. Right, and so we might call this like um, hidden symmetry breaking, and this is nothing new. This is, in a sense, it couldn't be older. This is the original viewpoint on SPT phases. It's symmetry breaking in some, you know, hidden or squeezed space. Right, that's how originally in the 80s people were thinking about string order parameters. Okay. 
So, and on this particular string order has been observed before. Um, so why am I talking about it? Why am I making a point about it? Well, what has not been appreciated is what it means. Okay, what does this mean topologically for our system? Right. But before I discuss that, let me first confirm that this is what happens, by the way, right? I did now just drew some pictures and I told you, you, you might find it plausible, you might not. So let, us, let me at least first confirm numerically what happens in the system, right? That brings me to the phase diagram. The same model again, for convenience, I repeated the model. And we have to fix some parameters, right? So let's take some Hubbard interaction, large with finite, say five, right? And I fix my hopping and Ising to be one. So I have two parameters left. I can tune my transverse field or I can tune my filling, right? And remember what we expected is that it ha it, if we're at half filling, we expect some just some spin chain physics. And that's what's shown here. Um, either we're an Ising uh, mod insulator, spontaneously breaking Rx symmetry, or we're in a trivial um, insulator depending on the, which jz or hx is, is the dominant coupling. But the new thing is then this other direction, right? If you tune mu, then we basically eventually dope the system. And what turns out to be interesting that if, if you dope a trivial insulator, you get a trivial Luttinger liquid. But if you dope the Ising anti fermagnet magnet, it turns out you get a topological Luttinger liquid, right? But what I mean by that, well, it has long range order in what I just said. So that's shown here. So, First of all, numerically, we observe that there's still long range order in the string order parameter. So there's hidden anti, anti, hidden anti formatic order in squeeze space. But at the same time, there's no, there's no symmetry breaking. See, the local order parameter decays to zero, which is algebraic long, uh, long range or quasi long range order. OK, so that's what we observe. Now, why am I making a point of it? Right? I, was, I, was, I was telling you that. It's actually very interesting that you have long range order in the string order parameter. So why is this? Well, exactly the point is that this string order parameter is impossible. In a sense, it shouldn't be able to exist, at least not according to the gap classification. Um, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, could you go back to the phase diagram? Sure. So, um, so I couldn't find the where is the um, half fitting. So the. Um, oh. I'm this, really this confused. Whole, it, so here is a control parameter is a chemical potential. So uh, it's not so clear that the, where is the half filling and the, such, yeah, such phase yeah. boundaries or something. Yeah, could yeah. you explain about that? Yeah, yeah. So basically, these two phases, maybe let, let me use black. These are mod limits where the local expectation was exactly what, or not expectation value, there's one fermion per site. Uh -huh. And it's only exactly here where we tune away from half filling. So it's yeah, only here yeah, where yeah. The chemical potential finally manages to energetically favor holes or, or doublons, depending on the sign of me. Uh, exactly, here's a phase uh, transition you were asking about. So it's some kind of Pokrovsky Talapov type of uh, phase transition. Um, to determine the uh, boundary line uh, along the uh, vertical direction is uh, uh, determined by calculating some particle number expectation value or something like that the vertical so this line oh ah, yeah this line yeah exactly yeah yeah i choose I, I calculate i literally calculate the uh the um um filling uh -huh. and so the filling is one exactly on the left i uh, see it is a uh is it sharply is it sharply changed or some... yeah so if you if you plot then function mm -hmm. of u it's say there's some reference value one right uh -huh. And then, depending on holes or doublons, it will go. Like, it will have some. Ah, I see. So this is some see. universal exponent that's known. Uh huh. No so one uh -huh. can even use that to. I see. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good. So why is this an impossible string order? So here I repeat the string order again. Excuse so, me. Yeah. Sorry for, uh, for this. Uh, the uh, spin-spin correlation functions. Uh, you see there are some oscillations when you try to increase the distance, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I just want, is there some reason for that? There's, oh, there's a yeah. up and down, up and down. Right, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's actually related to the previous answer. So this phase, both loading are liquids, have some incommensurate filling. And it has some Fermi momentum associated to it, which will appear in certain correlation functions and exactly one can exactly match, we check that this oscillation is given by cosine pi filling. So n being filling, not distance, ah, sorry, it's a bit messed. Let me write it bigger. We've exactly checked that the, it's cosine pi times filling 
times you know distance i minus j if one divides out of that phase vectors it becomes a straight line thank you thank you thanks okay so why is it an impossible string order so i repeat it again here so we have our our this it's a string order parameter for fermion parity right it's made i mean that's just that's the string right and so i know that fermion parity is the square of rx right at the same time, the endpoint operator, SZ, of course, is charged under Rx. It's odd, right? It's our rising order parameter. But this means there's only one symmetry necessary, right? It's kind of a symmetry. It's all, if, if, as long as you have Rx symmetry, this string order parameter, string order parameter is well-defined, right? And it's, all, it's somehow charged under itself, in a sense. So this, this is enough information to conclude there's a 1D SPT phase protected by Z4 symmetry, particularly distinct from the case where the endpoint operator is not charged under Rz. And what is the physical consequence? First of all, there are edge modes. And this, this is why I went into such detail earlier about showing why a cluster model has edge modes based on the string order parameter. You can, you can go through the same logic here, which it won't do. And you can derive that you have protected edge modes because of the string order. So you kind of already know it just from knowing the string order. But of course, we went and checked. And uh, we indeed find that with periodic manner conditions, um, because the system is actually a gapless, I guess I haven't specified too much yet, but the system is gapless at low energies. So there's some kind of hold Doppler fluctuations at low energies. So there's a one over L gap there from the usual CFT scaling. Um, so it has a unique ground state up to this one over L gap. But then if you look at the system with open boundaries, you numerically find there's a twofold degenerate ground state with exponentially small splitting. Okay. Now, okay, so we found that we have some impossible string order parameter in this gapless phase of matter, and that it has some edge modes because of it. Now, I was, er, earlier I mentioned that an, a second fingerprint of our intrinsic gapless SPT phase is an emergent anomaly. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. I just want to make sure on this slide, when you say 1D SPT, do you mean 1D gapless or gapless SPT? Yeah, this is right. It has to be gapless, right. So. Uh, with this symmetry setting, is it possible to have a gap to SPT? No, it's impossible. Now the symmetry uh, involves both boson and fermions. Maybe uh, I should call the symmetry Z4 times Z2 fermion parity mod Z2. With this symmetry, there's no SPT, no gap. Right. So even if you look at right, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I'm 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 being a bit careless there. With I'm just saying, oh look, you know, there's no protective representation, so we're done. And indeed, if you check more carefully the fermionic classification for Z4, or you can say Z4F, it's also zero. Yeah, there's no, there's no SPT there. Mm -hmm. I see. Also, uh, the degeneracy being two is kind of, uh, is it kind of strange? The degeneracy. Yeah, it, it, right. It's unusual for gapped SPTs because for gapped SPTs, the edges decouple because they're both gaps, so they can't talk. So if you have a twofold degeneracy, at one edge, you have it at the other edge as well, at least for bosonic systems. Um, now, it turns out that this, the reason it's two, twofold, not fourfold, is because if you would construct the four naive states, you will find that two of the four are split by the bulk gap. Because they can somehow couple, like the, you can kind of also intuitively see it in this, in this doped fermagnetic, anti fermagnetic picture, right? That if you, um, well, okay, let me, let me not, at a given time, let me not go into too much. But, yeah, it's, it's somehow because the gaplessness doesn't give you four, but only two edge modes. Okay, thanks. Uh, quick question, Ruben. Mm -hmm. So the uh, SZ correlation function without the string, is that the case is a power law? Exactly, that's shown here. Uh... Okay, it, it's a power law, it's not an exponential. Is it? Yeah, yeah, this is a power, indeed. It's a log law. So, and then, yeah, from this we can even check what is a loading liquid parameter, and we can check stability of the phase. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, th th thanks. Right. Good. Um, all right. So I was going to say, okay, how do we see an immersion anomaly? Um, so basically, so we have our Z4 symmetry microscopically in the system, right? And Essentially, we, we already saw that there's long range order in fermionic parity, right? And this is only possible because fer fermion parity is actually a gap symmetry, by right? which I mean any local operator charged in the fermion parity uh, costs a finite energy gap. So the, the low energy theory instead is a gapless Luttinger liquid, 
of, of, of even charges. So we have this kind of coexistence of a gapped sector and a gapless sector. Now, so far we talked about the gapped sector in a sense. We talked about th there's a gap C2 subgroup of Fermi's parity. And because this is gapped, you can have a long range order in its corresponding string order parameter. And then we talked about the string order parameter as a non-trivial charge. Now, this was the imp impossible string order parameter that we just discussed. Now, there's some kind of a converse statement to this. Okay, so if instead we don't look at the gap symmetry, but we look at the low energy remaining symmetry. So what is the low energy symmetry? Well, we start with our microscopic Z4, but then we cautioned out by whatever only acts on gap degrees of freedom, <clears throat> because the low energy theory simply doesn't notice the, the Z2 symmetry. And that quotient again is a Z2 symmetry at low energy. So basically Rx, even though it's Z4, it looks like a Z2 at low energy. Now you can ask, okay, what if you have the string of this Z2, but it is microscopically the string of Rx? Um, you can ask, what is this charge under Fermi parity? Like we're kind of, kind of doing the dual thing, right? So here we checked the string of parity under Rx, and now here we're checking the string of Rx under P, on the Fermi parity, or Rx squared. And you, and you can show that a certain reciprocity, that the charges have to match. I don't have time to go into that detail, but you can show that if you know the charge of one, you know the charge of the other. So we find that the string of Rx is charged under Rx squared. Now, why is this interesting? You might remember it is exactly the fingerprint of the Z2 anomaly we saw before, right? That even though at low energy, Rx looks like a Z2 symmetry, and that's true for any local gapless observable, it's not true for non-local strings. And then the non-local strings seem to remember that it's Z4. This is one way of seeing on the lattice that you have a Z2 anomaly. Of course, um, if you, if you're, some people prefer field theory perspective. So that's why I was planning to talk about the field theory, but I'm, I realized I'm, I'm, I'm already running a bit out of time. Um, so let's see, let me, let me maybe, let me maybe recap for now. So we thought we discussed the concrete lattice model with Z4 symmetry, and we found that it was an impossible string or parameter, and we saw indications that there was an emergent anomaly for the remaining low energy symmetry, okay? Um, now to get a better insight, Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so on the last slide, did you did you mean uh, this gapless SPT can be viewed as a gapped SPT on top of some gapless sector? No, that is very important. We can't. Like it's 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 funny. So the gap degrees of freedom are important, but they're, they're not in a sense. Like you can't factorize the SPT. So basically, no matter what gap SPT you stack on top. You can't remove this. That's maybe another way of thinking. So that's what makes it intrinsically gapless. Like it's really, if you, yeah, it's so you can't know. Okay. Yeah. Because the the it's it's in, we're using a gap symmetry, but its charge is non-trivial with respect to the gapless symmetry. So they're somehow very much interlinked. And if I have time, this will actually become clear also in the partition function point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I need to see what how I should uh, what I should do with time. Um, Maybe I will skip the field theory section, given time. I don't, I don't think you're really, um, there. So maybe I can just go to the punchline of the field theory section. So, uh, so forgive me if, if this seems a bit. I think, excuse yeah? me. I think people might ask. So maybe you will answer. Uh, can you write this uh, Z two kind of a, is a global anomaly, right? In terms of some topological invariant. Maybe that will be the punchline for field theory description. Well, we're asking about a topological action, right? So that actually, that would be that would, that would appear in the partition function, okay. um, right? Um, okay, at least I probably won't be able to discuss it, but at least I can point out where where it does appear. Um, okay, so the punchline is that maybe let me just say it in words. If we try to describe this topological Lodinger liquid by starting from this spinless, sorry, spinful fermion. So that's two component Lodinger liquid. It's kind of the mother theory, right? Before we add Ising and before we add all the other stuff, we just start with spin, spinful fermions, so two component Lodinger liquid. Then we can study the symmetry action on that in the field theory by Rx, and there's some non anomalous symmetry. Um, but what happens then if you perturb with Ising, it turns out you, you gap out one sector, but you have a remaining Lodinger liquid. And it turns out that the um, Rx symmetry acts anomalously on this remaining low energy Lodinger liquid. Okay, so, so basically that's what 
we're doing here. Uh, um, um, wondering if I should just skip it all together, but um, let me let me let me maybe go to the punchline here. Okay, so in our there's some useful variables I don't have time to explain, right? So there's some two component Lodinger liquid. And if we check how Rx works, acts on the Lodinger liquid, it does something like this. You know, there's some set, you know, phi 2 goes to phi 2 plus phi 1, and theta 2 goes to theta 2 plus phi 1. Okay, nothing special there. But it turns out that in the topological phase, we gap out the first field, phi 1, and it gets pinned to a value pi. So now if you plug that in here, we'll see that the effective symmetry on Rx on the remaining Lodinger liquid, so these phi 2 and theta 2 fields, they're describing our gapless Lodinger liquid in the ising hubbard chain that we just saw in the phase diagram, we see that they always get a pi shift. And those familiar with anomalies in the field theory, they might recognize, ah, this is the Z2 anomaly in the Lodinger liquid. So maybe to make a connection there is that this is the same field theory that arises when you study um, the Z minus X Z model, right? This is the example early on I gave about an anomaly, Z2 anomaly. If you just write down the field theory of this lattice model, you find exactly the same transformation on a lot of the liquid fields. Okay, so that's uh, well, was very quick. So, but um, that's one way of seeing how this emergent anomaly arises in the field theory. Right? And it's a very unambiguous. I just maybe wanted to show it for those that are less comfortable with the lattice uh, argument and maybe more comfortable with just seeing the field theory give you an anomaly C2 symmetry. Also, the field theory can allow you to derive the edge mode and the string order. All of that I, I will not go into here. Um, so an important point is now, okay, so this is apparently an example of an emergent Z2 anomaly. Right? So we start with a microscopic Z4, right? What happened is that we had a gapped Z2 subgroup of Z4. That had the impossible string order parameter. And then the remaining Z2 low energy theory, the Z4 quotient Z2, had an emergent anomaly. Okay, so now you might ask, what is the general principle and how, how does one construct one of these intrinsically gapless SP2 phases? Right, suppose you have your favorite anomaly, like suppose you want, you know, so you have your Z2 anomaly, how do you figure out to construct a system where at low energy you have this emergent anomaly, but in total system you don't have an anomaly? And this is where it's actually construct instructive so, to look at failed SPTs. So what's a failed SPT? It's just a normal SPT, uh, but you manage to trivialize it. So, okay, so suppose you have some anomaly that you like, your favorite anomaly. In d dimension, right? Take the d plus one d SPT where the anomaly lives in the edge, right? So those are quite well understood. And now, don't break the symmetry, but to use the words of of you know, paper with, with Juven and, and Chang and Wen and Witten, extend you know, extend the symmetry. So what this means physically, for example, you can add extra degrees of freedom in your system, which also transform non-trivially under the symmetry. So physically, you might think suppose to start with some bosonic Z two SPT but embedded in a fermionic Hilbert space or couple it to some fermions where the Z2 symmetry effectively acts like a Z4 symmetry on the fermions. So that has been studied before, this kind of stuff. All right. And it turns out that doing this, you can actually trivialize an SPT. Okay. So um, by including extra degrees of freedom, even though you don't break the symmetry, you can trivialize the SPT, you can you know, adiabatically transform the, 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 the bulk SPT to a trivial state. And that's usually sad news, right? Oh, my SPT is trivial, darn, right? Well, but here we point out that, no, it's actually, this is a useful tool to construct intrinsically gapless SPTs. Because what it means is that even though the higher dimensional bulk is now trivial, it means that the edge theory can be realized in D dimensions. It doesn't, it doesn't have to live at the edge of a D plus one dimensional system anymore, right? So the edge, in sense, has an emergent anomaly at low energies. And you know, usually if you, can, if you can construct the edge theory in its own dimension, you say, well, it's not interesting, it's not anomalous. But it can be interesting because I have an emergent anomaly. In particular, now because it lives in its own space-time dimension, you can truncate the system and have an edge. And then, so, you know, as, as we claim, such systems always have edge mode. Right. And this is a way of, of getting intrinsically gapless SPT phases. And what we just saw, this particular ising hubbard chain, one can reinterpret it as, aha, Someone took the 2 plus 1 d 11 goo, coupled it to fermions so that the Z2 became Z4. They trivialized the bulk and looked at the remaining edge theory. And then you know, look, looked at it as a genuine 1D model and then found this kind of uh, impossible string orders, edge modes, and emergent anomaly. Um, hi, Ruben. Hey. Quick question. 
Okay. Uh, so here, uh, adding fermion seems a, sort of a rather neutral uh, operation, but if I go for the symmetry extension and I have to bring the symmetry down, um, maybe by means of, if I do the, if I actually gauge the actual part of symmetry, I would mm. end up having an SET. So that would sort of defeat the purpose of doing this, right? So Yeah, exactly. So that's exactly the approach taken by these authors. So they right. extend it. Right, that you construct some boundary theory where they can handle on and engage the extension to, to again talk about the original symmetry as you were just saying as well. Right, so we would just do the same thing except we don't gauge. So we keep, we, we think of that the physical symmetry and now we kind of make that d dimensional system. When you say you don't gauge, you just mean that you turn on some, um, uh, well, you use whatever mechanism to gauge uh, the, the charge coupled to those symmetry that you maybe don't want at low energy to make them gap at low energy? Is that what the procedure is? Um, Instead of gauging? Oh, sorry, I, maybe I said it too complicated. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so if I do a symmetry extension, my symmetry group will be bigger than what I wanted. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but I don't want to see it in low energy, right? Is that the point? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, the so you want to make the extra stuff gapped instead of gauged. Is that exactly, the exactly. <laughs> So we, we naturally we start adding by gap degrees of freedom anyway, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is at the boundary, there's a useful distinction, right? The edge, suppose the edge star is in a gapless system. Right. right. Then we added some gap degrees of freedom mm -hmm. and you can convince yourself that as long as you don't, you know, drive a phase transition through with those gap degrees of freedom, then you're normally at low energy stable. You can't mm -hmm. gap it out. Yeah. And so that's kind of the setup we're thinking about. So you have right. to keep... I don't, yeah, if you really drive a phase transition for a gapped degrees of freedom, you can trivialize. And that's, of course, the point. It's not an intrinsic anomaly, it's an emergent anomaly. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, did you, I think I understand one, two. Did you already explain why the edge has, has an edge mode if it's real as the... Yeah, that's, that's a great question, right? That, that was a segue <laughs> into the next part. Is that, okay, how do we see that, right? Um, I've explained that maybe in 1D that there's some... Their, their fingerprints are somehow reciprocal. Even there, you might wonder how general that is. But indeed, there's a general argument that works on any dimension, any symmetry. Um, but I think I'm kind of out of time. So <laughs> um, this is going to be in the, in the last part of the partition function. So maybe should I just take you know, one minute, two minutes to wrap up? Um, Dominic, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, we should probably think about wrapping up. I don't think we have yeah. strict time limits for this seminar, but... Uh, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, so, okay, let me just take one minute to wrap it up, just to... Um, so this part might not be intelligible to people not familiar with partition functions, but at least those that are familiar, I just want to give some sense that... Um, so, for usual gap SPTs, we're familiar you might be familiar with them being characterized by coupling the partition function to a gauge field and you get some uh, topological action. I think this is what Juvenal's asking, you know, this kind of language was Juvenal was asking about before. Now, that's kind of well-known stuff, right? Which I won't repeat here. So the point is you can, one can generalize this slightly to gap, gapless systems. And so the main equation I just wanted to show is this. So we have our partition function for the whole system, but if you have gapless degrees of freedom, and gap degrees of freedom, on the, uh, one on the other hand, you can basically write your partition function the following way, where you have your partition function with a low energy degrees of freedom. And then if you imagine integrating out the gap degrees of freedom, you get this topological phase factor, just like before. Now, if both factors individually are gauge invariant, there's nothing special. Then you can just interpret this as an SPT factor, as was asked before. But we're exactly in the interest in the case, we say it's an intrinsically gapless SPT phase if the two factors individually are not gauge invariant. Right. And this actually already shows the link between um, immersion anomalies on the one hand, because by definition, this being not gauge invariant, right, is the same as an immersion, uh, the same as an anomaly. Whereas this being not gauge invariant, well, first of all, it means that omega itself has to be non-trivial. So that not imply some string order parameter in 1D, same, but a more generally some kind of topological response. But it not being gauge invariant means you can't associate to a gap SPT. Right? Otherwise, you could just you know, slap on some gap SPT and, and get rid of it. And so this is basically how you can think about intrinsically gapless topological phases. 
Um, and then what I'll skip is that there's a construction for gapless SPT phases. Um, and one, lastly, one can argue that there are edge modes. So basically, again, given time, I won't, I won't talk about this. The main point is that using this formalism, you can show that if you have an intrinsically gapless SPT phase, you can, you can argue that there have to be edge modes living at the boundary. And this kind of mimics the usual argument for gapped SPTs, but it turns out to still work in this kind of, uh, this kind of context where you have mixed low energy and high energy deep gapless user freedom. So sorry for rushing through that. Um, so then to conclude, why we saw that if we start with some on-site symmetry, it's possible to have so-called impossible topological, topological invariants on the one hand and immersion anomalies on the other hand that are actually equivalent properties. Um, and you know, with this general partition function point of view, you can do it in any dimension or equivalent. Think of this failed SPT. You start with some SPT in one in some dimension, and, and by playing this game, you can get an, uh, an intrinsically gapless SPT phase in one lower dimension. And some interesting examples, for example, you can you can start you know thinking about deep confined con quantum criticality in two plus one D, which is has some some famous anomaly, and it has been appreciated actually before that you can um, neutralize this anomaly by putting in a fermionic Hilbert space. And this actually, you can now interpret as giving you an intrinsically gapless SPT phase, for example. So I think there's a lot, a lot more fun examples to work out um, in, in, this, in this universe. Good, so let me once again thank my collaborators, Ryan and Ashvin, and let me thank all of you for your time and attention.